gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so grateful and so very thankful for the wonderful message of good news that you've given us to proclaim whereby our lives are not unfruitful. We just give you all the honor, the glory, and the credit. I ask that you filter out any foolishness but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to Titus, verse by verse. We're in chapter 3. And verses 4 through 7 are a, a powerful, concise statement of the gospel, the good news. We are to proclaim that the Lord Jesus Christ has given himself in our place, and it was not by anything that we did, but according to his mercy that he delivered us, and that by regeneration we've been cleansed and we have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. And God did this, and he did this abundantly. He did that more than sufficiently through Jesus Christ our Lord in order that having been made righteous by His grace we are also made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We then looked at the 8th verse. This is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. The word saying there in the text being the word logos, faithful is the word. And I don't find it at all odd or strange that verse 8 would follow the concise statement of what we just read in verses 4 through 7. Good news, which I, for one, am not going to add any conditions to. We have the faithful word that God through Christ, when you were his enemies, when you, when you were not seeking him, when you were not in righteousness, when you were not pleasing him, and more than that, when you were unable to please him in that unrighteous condition, he redeemed you and made you righteous. That's what we've been looking at here. And he did this through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, we are warned not to reduce the work of Christ to not, to zero. And that is done so many times. It's said that, that Jesus Christ started a process which is up to you to finish. But when my Lord declared on the cross it is finished, I believe that it was finished. This is the word of faithfulness, not yours, but God's. God's word is faithful. And, and God's work is faithful. And so these things I will that you affirm constantly. Uh, I'm sure there are many that watch this channel who, at least in, in they, they might uh, at times think that I, I'm really repetitive and that I repeat myself a lot. Folks, I don't mean to do that. This is His Word. We are to affirm it constantly. And as we look at this verse, the English language seems to say to me that I ought to do this all the time. Therefore, well, I shouldn't eat or sleep. You know, that I should be constantly declaring this work. Now, I'm not going to tell you that, that there isn't some sense of continuity in, in the Word but the word in the Greek means uniformly. The word means to declare these things uniformly in agreement with the word of God. The idea in the language is, is not so much that you do this 24 hours a day, but that you do it uniformly. I think the argument here is for a non-contradictory position. Jesus Christ paid it all. Don't sing that and then preach something else. These things I will that you affirm uniformly without contradiction in order that they which have believed, that's a perfect tense, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. The word careful there 
is give considerable thought to. In other words, reason it out. That they, those who have believed in God, might give considerable thought to maintain, maintain, the word means to stand before, it's a compound word in the Greek, to stand before good works. That's what good uh, and prof that's what is good and profitable unto men. Much of what the so-called Christian community calls good works may not be good works. Give careful thought to stand before good works. That's what good and, and profitable is. And as I pointed out in my last video, if the good works of verse 8 is our works, then verse 9 would make no sense. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. There is a, a kind of uniformity, a consistency in the teaching of the grace of God and the power of that grace applied in the life of the totally depraved sinner. No synergism. Totally depraved. And beyond that new birth, into a daily walk whereby as new creations in Christ, the same grace of God applies to our walk that applied to our being redeemed. The law is not made for a righteous man, either in our new birth or our walk. A righteous man, and that is what we are, just as total depravity required the sovereignty of God in Him redeeming us, Sin shall not, shall not have dominion over us, for we are not under law. That, that is that which pertains to our old man, the flesh. We're not under law, but grace. The reason the Holy Spirit puts the ninth verse there is because that's the area in which many of these things called good works take place. The flesh, law, the old man. Folks, just as his death was indispensable as far as our being made righteous was concerned, our death to sin, self, the law, is indispensable as far as our sanctification is concerned. Now, your Bible tells you that ye have died unto sin. It doesn't say you need to die, you must die, you should die, you ought to die. It says ye have died. Now, whether you're going to live that way or not is the question. Just as it says that you've been raised from the dead. We've been raised with Christ. It's not telling you that you need to be raised with Christ. It's saying that you have been raised with Christ. The question is whether, you're, whether or not you're going to live that way. Verse 9, but avoid, avoid. And it's a, a present imperative. It's a command in the present tense. So it means keep on shunning, turning from what? From foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about what? The law. The word foolish is stupid. In the Greek, it's moros, moron. Turn away from moronic questions, stupid questions. Many Christians want to spend their lives in that area. Far too many do. It seems to me that our present context is saying that we should give very careful and considered thought to what good works are, that they ought to be said in the context of this faithful saying or this faithful word that we've just been given by the Holy Spirit, which is a concise statement of the work of Christ. And we ought to stand away from stupid questions. My Bible tells me, turn away from foolishness. And this in relation to law-keeping as a means of redemption, as well as law-keeping as a rule of life. Since both our new birth and our ongoing walk is governed by grace, not law. Dearly beloved, this channel is not unique in this sense. For a fact, sound doctrine these days is rarely taught, but God has His testimony and His people all over the world. They're all different colors and they're all different educational, uh, they're from different educational backgrounds. 
We're all members of the body of Christ. And so I have to take the word genealogy for much of, of the conflict that I see in the Christian community where that even race becomes a factor. Especially when you think back on, on the Jewish, Gentile, uh, Jew versus Gentile question early on at the beginning of the church. I know a God whose grace and mercy sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die in the place of every one of his own from every race, kindred, tribe, and tongue. We'll all be together in glory singing salvation is of the Lord. I don't believe there's a race of people or a tribe, any place that doesn't have some of God's elect in it. Now that includes China, Iran, just name the country. It is phenomenal how much the law comes in, comes into the considerations, the discussions, and the debates of Christians. It's just inconceivable that God could have redeemed anyone unless that person did something. There's always somebody that wants to put you under law. You know, women shouldn't wear, you know, that which pertains to a man and vice versa and, and, and I mean, I bought a pair of, uh, of overalls at a thrift store just to find out it didn't have a zipper fly in front because they were women's overalls and I wore them anyway because they fit so well. Really actually can't tell the difference, couldn't tell the difference whether they were men or women except for the fly in the front was missing. That's, that's how I found out that they were women's. I guess that falls in the area of scruples. You don't have to go to Israel to see all the foolishness of the law. You don't have to do that. Just, just go to, just to most any church on any street corner in America today. In which case, neither what I teach or my overalls would be very welcome. Folks, we are not... Un I don't know how many, I bet I've said this a thousand times on this channel. We're not under law, but grace. That is a, a clear, concise statement of Scripture. Yet, yet, the majority of Christians today don't believe that. When it's true, we are not under law, but grace. And that, that doesn't just pertain to your being born again. It pertains to your ongoing walk and relationship and fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And because you are under grace, sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not. We are commanded to be holy as God is holy. And Christians today, they'll read that as law. When there is an absolute holiness, which we could in no way, no way attain other than through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That work has been done. Christ declared it is finished. We don't argue that. We proclaim it because it's true. Those kind of contentions, those who argue against that, are not profitable. They are unprofitable and vain. They are empty. They are vain, as in empty. You're not going to gain any ground by engaging in those kinds of, of contentions. I have never put you folks under the law, at least not to my knowledge. And if I, who know the truth of this, ever do put you under law, you should rebel and you should turn away from it. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Verse 10, and I believe that is about where I left off last time. Well, this is in the same context. I don't think that we've drawn a line there at the end of verse 9 and said, well, now we're looking at a totally different subject. So we have to look at the word heretic. You'll probably be shocked to know that I have on several occasions been called a heretic. I received a letter from a, a church where I preached several years back. Dear brother Steve, we, we really enjoyed your message. You know, for 40 minutes you spoke and not once did you talk about how Christians ought to live. Well, I, I thought I did. And so you engaged in heresy, Steve. And, and 
and, and one's got to ask what heresy is. I think it's, it's very, very easy to call somebody a heretic. I know a little bit about the Greek word, and I know a little bit about what the Greek word means. The Greek word says that a heretic is a man who, in the face of evidence, would rather follow his own opinion. There are people who don't believe we ever put a man on the moon who think that that, that whole thing was fake. In the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, someone can form their own opinion. Now you can do that, we all do that. We all have opinions, but in our present text, it is in the face of overwhelming evidence that Christ's work was sufficient. One has the opinion that it wasn't. That makes the person a heretic. That in the face of overwhelming evidence, they form their own opinion, contrary to that evidence, and they hold to it. That's what the word means. So how do we apply it? This person believes that you must repent of your sins, you must accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, and you must be water baptized by immersion, you know, three times, face forward, or you're not going to go to heaven. Is that person a heretic? If he understands the overwhelming evidence if, listen to me, if he understands the overwhelming evidence, the Word of God says he is. Therefore, it's not right, it's not consistent to brand that someone who, who doesn't know a, her, a heretic. That's what I believe we're looking at here. I think that takes you outside the Word as I understand the Word in the Greek. An individual who, in the face of overwhelming evidence, assumes or prefers to follow his own opinion. That's a heretic. I don't think ignorance allows you to brand somebody a heretic. We don't tell a, 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 a child in the first grade who doesn't understand algebra or, or calculus or, you know, that they're a heretic, that they've turned themselves away from algebra. They just haven't learned it yet. You, you couldn't even call them stupid. They're just at a stage in their development where they haven't learned these kinds of things. So I have a great problem defining a heretic. I know what her heretical teaching is, but, but is the individual a heretic? From whom do I turn away? Well, here is somebody that says something that you know is anti-biblical, and so you sit down with them the first time, and you correct them, but, but here the Holy Spirit says, I ought to do this twice before I reject them. Many times I've done that, and people have turned out to be the most wonderful friends. Other times they've said, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care, Steve. I know that's what the verse says. I don't care. I believe this or that or the other thing. And that's where I have a problem. The very fact that one would not care what this book says seems to say to me that we're in deep water. A man who forms his own opinion in the light of overwhelming evidence, and I see that overwhelming evidence as the Word of God. Now, if you don't think a word means what I think it means, that's not heresy. I doubt seriously if any one of you out there agree with me on everything. In fact, I think most of you probably disagree with me on, every, on most, most everything. But I don't think either one of us would brand each other a heretic. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God without question? That this book is the inspired word of God? Without question, then, we can... We can surely have areas where we can discuss. But if you don't care what this book says, then suddenly you've stepped out of that frame of reference. A man who forms his own opinion in the light of overwhelming evidence or in the face of overwhelming evidence after the first and, not first or, not first or second, first and second, admonition, reject. That is, stand away from turn aside from. If after the second admonition you haven't won, then forget it. 
You're not going to argue over and over and over again about these foolish things, these stupid things in verse 9, because you know in verse 11 that, that such a one is subverted. That word subverted there, that is a perfect passive. The passive voice. The subject did, did not initiate or complete the action. It was an outside agent. Passive voice, subverted, has been subverted in past time with the result that he remains permanently subverted from an outside cause. The passive voice says he didn't subvert himself. He apparently didn't do this to himself. The passive voice says you cannot take the operator as this person. This is a person who has been, who has been subverted. It seems to me that the obvious operator here is Satan. But if you think it's somebody else, then I'm not going to, well, I'm not going to stand away from you and call you a heretic. I don't know who the operator was. I think the operator was Satan. And sinneth, says the text, that is, he continues in sin. He continues in sin being self-condemned. The only place in the New Testament in the, in the, in the Greek that this word is used, self-judged, self-condemned. It means that his activities are sufficient in themselves as the evidence of self-judgment. I think it means the person in verse 10 is not a member of the family or the household of God. I think the stupidity of striving about the law is that by virtue of the law, we, we can in any way gain merit with God. Law is one thing. Law keeping is another. And it is always used, all, it, especially nowadays, more than at any other time, I believe. That's not to say that if you, if you, didn't, jump, if you didn't jump in a time machine and go back to the first century that you wouldn't see it. But nowadays, more than ever, Law keeping is, is, is used as a stepping stone of merit or acceptance to God by one's actions. And that, I believe, biblically, to be stupid, moronic, because that wasn't the purpose of the law. The law wasn't made for a righteous person, but you were told in verse 7, you've been made righteous. So it's, it's stupid to bring up the law in the sense of human merit when you've been made righteous. I have told Christians this for 30 years. And you ought to see the look on, the, on most of their faces when, when, I, when I tell them this. You, you folks, listen to me. You have been made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. You can't become any more righteous than what you already are. Not by what you do or do not do. The law was not made for you. It was made for the unlawful. What the grammar is saying is that this person has been subverted by an outside operator, which I conclude to be Satan, and his actions show that his actions are self-judging actions. They show that he's been subverted. What the verse is saying is that this man's actions, this man's position, is showing forth the fact that he's been subverted. The Greek word does, doesn't only include the idea of forming an opinion in the face of overwhelming evidence that's contrary to the facts, to the evidence, but pushing, pushing that opinion. One who is contentious in pushing that opinion. Now we come to verse 12, verses 12 through 15. I believe the text to be saying, I'm going to send Artemis or Tychicus to you to relieve you of that responsibility in Crete. And when I do that, I need you in Nicopolis. I've determined to spend the winter there. And I'm going to send this letter with, with an attorney called Zenith. And I want you to do everything you can to speed them on their way and help them in their missionary activity. 
God could have done this in any number of ways. God didn't need Paul. He didn't need Artemis. He didn't need Tychicus. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But the Almighty, Eternal God has declared that we trust Him in all things. The Holy Spirit has decided that Paul is going to winter at Nicopolis. That word is in the perfect tense. Paul didn't make that decision. God made it for him. He's going to send Artemis or Tychicus, one or the other, to help Titus. In fact, I believe to relieve Titus so he could come and help Paul in, in uh, Nicopolis. Why does he need any help? I mean, we don't. We don't need, you know, he, he ordains that we proclaim the gospel, but, but that Paul might learn to trust him. It, it was good for, for Paul to go through what he went through. I've said this a hundred times. I'll say it again. If you could go to glory today and if you could pull Stephen aside and say, uh, you know, uh, Stephen, wasn't it terrible that they stoned you? I think Stephen would probably scratch his head and he'd say, was I stoned? I mean, I, now, of course, he knew he was stoned. But my point is that it, it'll be nothing compared to the glory of heaven. Isn't it enough that the eternal God declared, I know the way you take. When I've tested you, you'll come forth as gold. That I'll, I will keep that which you have committed unto me against that day. That I'll never under any condition ever cease to sustain and uphold you. I will be there. I've gone the way before you. When the pressures seem intense, when the load seems more than you can bear, can't you hear his voice just, you know, ringing through the corridors of time? You know, fear not for I am with thee even unto the end. In the 23rd Psalm, when you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, he will, he will be with you, not, not, you know, that is with you, not waiting on the other side. But he said, I'll be with you. There's Artemis or Tychicus. They don't have an easy life. We don't know anything about Artemis. We know, uh, we know a lot about Tychicus. He worked with Paul quite a bit. I have no idea who Artemis is. Nobody else seems to, to know. Paul, I've determined there to winter. The very word winter speaks of cold difficulty, a rough time. And the Holy Spirit is determined to have Titus there with him through those hours of difficulty. Bring Zenos, the lawyer. And, well, and I don't know who Zenos the lawyer was. Nobody else does either. He's not mentioned any place else. It's interesting that Zenos is a Greek name. In fact, if you look at all these names, Artemis, okay, Zenos, uh, Apollos, <laughs> it's interesting to me, and I, I didn't see this at first, but as I was really meditating on this last, these last few verses, it, it suddenly dawned on me that these were all names of pagan gods. Artemis, Apollos, Zenos. Now, I, I don't know what, what to do with that. I, I do find it interesting. I'll leave that to you to think about. But there are those who say that Zenos was a Roman lawyer. He was an expert lawyer. And when you went to Nicopolis, you needed an, an attorney who knew the laws of that area and that city. So there's every possibility that, that, that he was a Jewish attorney skilled in the Mosaic law, as well as a, in Roman law, civil law. And you have, you have more of a religious thought than than a secular thought going on there. I'm going to leave that to you too as well. I don't know what the right answer is. If you want my opinion, he, he might have, well, for all I know, he was both. What Paul's concern was is of question here.
I'm more, I guess I, I would lean more toward the religious than the, 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 the secular, the civil. Paul's concern was more about Jewish mosaic law than it was civil law. Even though in the context and in, in this very study, we've, we've, we've seen that uh, we are to be subject to those that God has ordained over us. So I'm going to leave that to you. I'm unsure about that. Perhaps Paul wanted a person skilled in Roman law, you know, for his determination to spend the winter in Nicopolis to make sure that he met the civil requirements. And now verse 14, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. And it's exactly the same word translated maintained in verse 8. There's the very great possibility that the verse means that we should stand before those perfect works, perfect works, beautiful in the sense of their completion. If you look at the Greek, the structure of the words, beautiful in the sense of their completion and perfection uh, is what we're looking at there. Now, I suppose we could take that to say, well, no, what that means is, you know, is, well, is the good works there. What that means is that's paying Zenus uh, his attorney fee, buying an airline ticket for Artemis and Tychicus, you know, to, you know, and, for, you know, to some extent, folks, that may all be true. But if that's the highlight that we put on the verse, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Anybody headed for hell who has any measure of, of human sympathy or human compassion could pay bills and give money. You know, it's done by the millions. But if we are to stand faithfully before the perfection of the finished work of Christ, which has been so thrust pushed forward throughout this entire epistle, it can't be counterfeited. That's the thing we need to learn the most. And when we do that, we are not unfruitful. We're not unfruitful when we proclaim Jesus Christ, that His work was sufficient in our lives, that we don't add anything to that, that we can't add anything to that. Those works that God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them, we're not going to be unfruitful. That's the thing that we need to learn the most. And when we do that, well, because everything else springs forth from that. Let those of us who belong to God learn to stand before perfectly complete works. That is the perfect finished work of Christ. The works that He prepared beforehand that we, we should walk in them. That's how, that's how I see this. So we won't be unfruitful. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I do not believe that Paul was as, as concerned about his own needs as he was the needs of Titus, as, as he was those in Crete. You know, in his wanting Titus to come to him. No doubt, with a good report of those whom the Lord blessed through his ministry, Titus's ministry there in Crete, I found so more than once in my life where that. I would have gladly traded uh, some creature comfort for, for some uh, spiritual blessing. Anyway, we're we're looking at uh, just about the end of this epistle, and I don't know about I, I honestly don't have much more to say. Uh, 
All that are with me salute thee, that says the text. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now the word be is not there. If you have the authorized version, it's italicized or it's in parentheses by adding the word be. And I'm sure the translators have decided that that, that adds to the meaning. But let me tell you, folks, it also detracts from the meaning because it gives you the idea, well, there's a possibility of grace, you know, being with you. And, you know, there's a possibility of grace not being with you. You know, when it would be better to just say grace is with you all, which is what the original text says. And I find that astounding. And I find that I find that an excellent way to conclude this study on Titus. My prayer is that you found this study with me through Titus helpful. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.